Coming up on Network Africa. Rwanda finds Paul Rusesa Bagina guilty of terror-related crimes. African presidents gather in New York with other world leaders for the 76th UN General Assembly. Plus, South African business group calls for an end to lockdown in the country. Hello and a warm welcome to the program. I'm Layo Adegoki. We begin today with stories and happenings that made headlines over the weekend. Reacting to the ECOWAS sanctions, the leader of Guinea's recent coup told a delegation of West African leaders he was not concerned about new sanctions imposed by the regional bloc to pressure a swift transition to constitutional rule. Speaking on Saturday, his spokesperson said coup leader Mamadi Dumbuya has shrugged off the move, telling high-level ECOWAS envoys that, as soldiers, their work is in Guinea, and there's nothing to freeze in their accounts. There were honest and sincere talks between the ECOWAS delegation and President Mamadi Dumbuya. On the first point, the immediate release of the former president. The delegation was able to meet the former president, and it is clear for everyone that the former president will remain in Guinea. Everything will be done to keep him physically and mentally safe. The talks were very brief regarding these sanctions. The president told them, we are soldiers, our mission is in Guinea, so we don't need to travel. Also, there is nothing to freeze on our bank accounts. The bloc's decision to impose sanctions reflects members' desire to deter a further democratic backsliding in the region after four military-led coups in West and Central Africa since last year. They have demanded a six-month transition in Guinea. In response, Colonel Dumbuya told the delegation the will of the Guinean people should be taken into account. Several hundred demonstrators gathered in Tunis on Saturday to protest against Tunisian President Kais Saeed's seizure of governing powers in July, which triggered a constitutional crisis and prompted accusations of a coup. Protesters in the center of the capital chanted, shut down the coup, and we want to return to legitimacy, while a few dozen Saeed supporters held a counter-demonstration chanting, the people want to dissolve parliament. The protest, accompanied by heavy police presence, was the first since Saeed declared on July 25th that he was sacking the Prime Minister, suspending Parliament and assuming executive authority. Saturday's protest may provide an indication of how the security services, many of whose leadership are newly appointed by Saeed, will handle public opposition to him. Police appear to be treating both sets of protesters equally standing between the two camps outside the ornate Belle Epoque Theatre on Habib Burguba Avenue. On Sunday, former Algerian President Abdulaziz Bouteflika, ousted in 2019 after mass protests, was given a state funeral that was attended by senior officials but received little of the attention given to such occasions in the past. Bouteflika died on Friday, aged 84. An armored vehicle decked with flowers pulled his coffin, covered with the national flag, and a gun carried from his home in Zeralda, west of the capital, to the El Aliya Cemetery in Algiers, where five of his predecessors are buried. Bouteflika was first elected in 1999 and is widely credited with the national reconciliation policy that restored peace after a war with armed Islamists in the 1990s. But many Algerians blame him for the economic stagnation of his latter years in power, when he was rarely seen in public after suffering a stroke, and widespread corruption led to the looting of tens of billions of dollars from a state that depends heavily on its large oil and gas reserves. He stepped down in April 2019 after mass demonstrations to reject his plan to seek a fifth term and demand political and economic reforms. 
To our main stories for today, a court in Rwanda has found the former hotel manager who's credited with saving hundreds of people during the 1994 genocide guilty of terror-related crimes. Paul Rusesa Bagina, whose actions inspired the Hollywood movie Hotel Rwanda, boycotted the trial and was not present in court. He's accused of being the mastermind and financier of a rebel group that carried out attacks in Rwanda in 2018, killing at least six people. A Rwandan court found Paul Rusesa Bagina, a former hotel manager portrayed as a hero in a Hollywood film about the 1994 genocide, guilty of being part of a group responsible for terrorist attacks. The court finds that they should be found guilty for being part of this terror group, MRCD, FLN. They attacked people in their homes, they attacked people in their cars, or even on the road traveling. The case has had a high profile since the 67-year-old was arrested last year on arrival from Dubai after what he described as a kidnapping by Rwandan authorities. Human Rights Watch said at the time that his arrest amounted to an enforced disappearance, which it called a serious violation of international law. Scenes being portrayed by actor Don Chidley in the 2004 film Hotel Rwanda, Rusesa Bagina emerged as a prominent critic of President Paul Kagame. He had denied all charges against him, while his supporters called the trial a sham and proof of Kagame's ruthless treatment of political opponents. Prosecutors had sought a life sentence on nine charges, including terrorism, arson, taking hostages and forming an armed rebel group, which he directed from abroad. Mr. Rusesa Bagina, who became a global celebrity after the film, used his fame to highlight what he described as rights violations by the Kagame government, a Tutsi rebel commander who took power after his forces captured Kigali and halted the genocide. Rwandan journalist Magnus Mazimpaka joins us now for more on this. Thank you for speaking to us on the program. Talk to us a little bit more about how today's verdict was handed down. Was this expected? <laughs> You can hear me, can Magnus. I was asking how today's, you know, how the judgment was handed down today. Talk to us more about today's court proceedings that, you know, convicted Paul Rusesa Bagina of being guilty. Well, um, what happened in court today was uh, kind of expected, uh, largely from uh, uh, the Rwandan uh, public, but also for those who've been following the case who are very much aware and who have been following the the hearings from the from day one this was expected the only unexpected part was the the fact that uh, it was 125 years and others the largest majority of Rwandans thought maybe it was possibly a life sentence Well, what has been the reaction, you know, to the judgment from all parties involved? We understand his supporters have called this a sham. Well, the thing is, uh, for, for many people who are aware of the case, it's like catching a village, a village thief who has been uh, ramshackling and uh, stealing from everyone in, in the neighborhood. It's not a strange thing that he was handed over 25 years in prison. In fact, the verdict was kind of expected by the public because uh, most of the ac accusations are vivid. Some of the victims are people uh, that are, are well, well known in, in an area that is not far from the capital city. So it was very difficult for him and his defense team to uh, defend themselves against the allegations, uh, especially that uh, there is evidence that uh, his operations had taken long, almost almost two decades.
that's very difficult for him to defend. All right, then. Thank you so much, Magnus Mazim Packer, joining us there from Kigali. Let's get an update on what's happening in Guinea. The new junta arrested a former minister, ransacking his home before releasing him hours later. Armed men in uniform, a set of raided Tibu Kamara's apartment in the capital Conakry in the morning, took him to an unidentified location before he was freed later in the afternoon. Well, several items, including mobile phones, were seized. His arrest has been confirmed by the ruling National Committee of Reconciliation and Development. CNRD, as well as his team. The coup leaders accuse him of violating a commitment to stay neutral towards the military administration. Mr. Kamara was the industry minister and an advisor to former President Alpha Conde, who was ousted earlier this month. Several African presidents have arrived in New York for the UN General Assembly. Tanzania's Samia Suluhu, Zambia's Hakainde Hichilema, Ghana's Nana Kufo Ado, Botswana's Mugweti Masisi and Nigeria's Muhammadu Buhari have so far confirmed that they will be attending. President Samia of Tanzania and President Hakainde of Zambia are making their debut at the assembly. Mr. Hakainde was scheduled to have a meeting with President Joe Biden, but it will now be held with Vice President Kamala Harris. That's according to the Lusaka Times newspaper. Well, back in his home, he's earning some praise online for traveling with a lean team for the UN General Assembly, traveling to the UN meeting on a commercial flight from the main airport in Lusaka and accompanied by just two ministers. Well, most heads of state are also joining the assembly, uh, joining the assembly virtually because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, ahead of the General Assembly's debate, debate, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says it is time to ring the alarm bell, adding that his message to world leaders is wake up, change course, unite and let's try to defeat the enormous challenges we are facing today. The Secretary General also underscored the need for a global vaccination plan, bringing together all those that produce or can produce vaccines to double the production with equitable distribution. It's time to ring the alarm bell. We are on the verge of a precipice and we are moving in the wrong direction. Look at the vaccination. Look at uh, the difficulties in bringing together all countries to make sure that we make COP26 a success. Look at the multiplication of conflicts we have witnessed in the last few months. Uh, we need to change course and we need to wake up. So my message to the leaders, wake up, change course unite and let's try to defeat the enormous challenges we are facing today. The problem is this virus is spreading like wildfire in the global south mm -hmm. and spreading like wildfire it is mutating, it mm -hmm. is changing mm -hmm. and there is a risk that at a certain moment one of these mutations will bring a virus that is able to resist the vaccines that now are applied. And in that day, nobody will be safe in the south and in the north, not even in the, in the countries where everybody was vaccinated. So this is a reason to understand that the priority must be to vaccinate everybody everywhere. And that is why we made an appeal for um, all the measures uh, to be taken in order to guarantee that 70% of the population of the world will be vaccinated in the middle of next uh, year. Mm -hmm. Still ahead on the program. Egyptian designer challenges global fashion standards, catering to Egyptian women's clothes for all shapes and sizes. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. A South African business group, Sakeliga, has lodged a court application to compel the South African government to disclose its grounds for the continued state of disaster management and lockdown levels. The group has called for an end to the state of disaster which it claims has seen nearly 2 million people being in unemployed and livelihoods lost. While well, the country recently moved to adjusted alert level two lockdown restrictions and the move has been met with a bittersweet reaction. 
There has been an outcry in South Africa over the continued national state of disaster. From political parties who are gearing up for the upcoming local government elections, to churches who like to have more congregates, to even business groups who have gone as far as filing a court order. We lodged an application with the High Court in Gauteng to obtain the records on which Minister Lamini Zuma based their decision um, over these past 18 months, actually the multiple decisions regarding lockdown, the levels of lockdown, the various restrictions. What is the basis on which the lockdown decisions are being made? And that is what we want uh, to see, and that is what we think is imperative for a good decision to be made, public scrutiny. To take the nation a step closer to normal, government recently moved the country to adjust at alert level two. Uh, given the fact that we've got a drop in transmissions and drop in hospitalizations. Um, and I think that uh, it's going to make campaigning in the election a lot easier to do uh, because uh, you're able to have bigger gatherings and the sort. The big thing South Africans need to know is what are the circumstances under which we can exit uh, the state of disaster and these uh, ends of lockdown. I think the president and his team need to say very clearly to citizens uh, you know, what our side of the you know, of the, of the contract is. My workforce, just on a Sunday, my workforce is uh, 127 workers, the ushers, my TV crew, uh, and, and the choir. So we're excited that we're allowed 250, but I think we've been clamoring and telling the president that at least they should allow us, for those of us that have a large congregation, you know, they should allow us um, 50%. Medical practitioners do believe it's early days to end the national state of disaster and have called for caution. I think we have to be a bit, uh, uh, will I say, a bit cautious, you know, uh, in our calls for a complete uh, removal of the lockdown restrictions. I mean, we, I think we got our fingers bent the first time we had a first wave last year, and uh, it seemed as if there was a you know, significant decline in infections. Only have to have a second wave towards. Um, uh, December holidays, when things were quite restricted. So I think, you know, people have termed it, quote unquote, the new normal. The new normal is a delicate balance between how do we ensure that we break this uh, uh, community transmission in the country, at the same time trying to balance uh, the, the, um, the need for citizens to be involved in economic activities to sustain uh, the country economically. Meanwhile, President Cyril Ramaphosa responding to a written parliamentary Q&A said all organs of state must develop sustainable regulatory measures for the control of COVID-19 before the state of emergency regulations can be lifted. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Brian Pugeni, Channels Television News. The move by the United Kingdom to keep South Africa in its travel red list has not been welcomed by the South African government, businesses and even travelers in general. South Africa's Department of International Relations and Cooperation says it will intensify efforts to get the country removed from the United Kingdom's travel red list, which will see travelers going through incredibly restrictive and expensive quarantine conditions. Minister Naledi Pandor says her department is working with other stakeholders to have South Africa removed from the list and is hopeful that the UK will realize that their decision is not harming just the tourism industry but other businesses from both countries. As South Sudan makes the long journey from winning independence a decade ago through a long and brutal war to rebuilding its economy and democracy, people across the country are beginning an important debate about a new permanent constitution. Well, to support public, the, the public debate, the United Nations mission in South Sudan is working in partnership with a local non-governmental organization to host a special two-day workshop. Participants include political leaders university think tanks, civil society women, and youth groups, media, and international partners all partaking in the peace process. To me, a people-driven constitution-making process and the product is a process whereby people are allowed to speak, but also an environment is created, a conducive environment for everybody to air out their views and aspirations in regards to what kind of constitution we want. And not to 
not to forget a constitution at this moment is not just South Sudanese developing a constitution, or it's not that we are renewing a social contract. In the first place, we actually need to cultivate and establish a social contract. The constitution making process is, is, is very important, and you know, with the with the, uh, as I said to you earlier, with the inauguration of TNLA uh, of, and the Parliament, you now have that legislature, and, and this is the the, the, the moment um, to make sure and to support uh, widespread consultations throughout the country, so everybody feels included and able to 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 project their own voice. Bird conservationists in South Africa say 63 endangered African penguins have been killed by a swarm of bees in a rare occurrence near Cape Town. The protected birds from a colony of Simon's Town were found on a beach with multiple bee stings with no other injuries. An official from the Southern African Foundation for the Conservation of Coastal Birds lamented the penguins' deaths, noting the species is already in danger of extinction. Cape honeybees are also part of the local ecosystem, which features several conservation areas. African penguins feature on the red list of the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Researcher and our veterinarians on site here who did all the postmortems, they started to discover that the birds had um, bee stings in, in their kind of, they have these patches over their eyes where they don't have feathers. Um, so those are basically the only bare skin patches in a, in a penguin um, and that's where they found all the bee stings and then they actually went back to the site and found dead bees on the beach as well and then they called in a bee expert who also kind of confirmed that what she could see there must have been some kind of disturbed nest or something and the swarm must have attacked them. It is very very unlikely and very unusual. Um, it is obviously dramatic to, to lose that number of, of birds and those were big adults, healthy birds breeding. Um, but the, the reason why it is so tragic is that the African penguin is highly endangered. Um, and we have so few birds left in the wild that um, you know, a healthy population could easily deal with a freak incident like this. But because there are already so few birds left in the wild, we're basically trying to save every single one. And then losing that number of birds is obviously horrible. An Egyptian fashion designer has decided to start her own line of clothing that's tailoring each piece of her work to the client's shape, size and style preference. This is part of her efforts to counter global fashion industry trends that she says attempts to homogenize body sizes and styles. Dub Rafia, Arabic for the woman who mends clothing. The company was launched in 2015 by 29-year-old Noura Galal, whose main goal was to make the Egyptian woman feel beautiful, comfortable, and in control of her own body. Our goal is that Rafaya helps the Egyptian woman feel beautiful, without feeling that she needs to change herself and without having to conform to a stereotypical image that the fashion industry usually sets as a goal for women. We want women to feel beautiful without facing any obstacles. Rafaya not only tailors clothes to each woman's body, but also lets the client choose the colors, cuts, and fabrics, giving her complete control over how she wishes to represent herself in a piece of fashion. We try to work on different campaigns with different ideas. For example, we are trying to fight the idea that the chubby girl should wear black and not white so that she looks thinner, or that the dark-skinned girl shouldn't wear colors for whatever reason. We try to work on these ideas, but without making ourselves subjectable to social media bullying. We try to work on this until there is enough awareness that this is normal. The thing I like most about Rafaia is that I customize what I want to fit my sizes. I don't find anything transparent, and the quality cut is always perfect. I used to struggle a lot when I went to shops, as I would find clothes with poor material or material that is transparent. And as a veiled woman, I really struggled with those things. 
things wouldn't suit me easily or they wouldn't be my size. With Rafia, I could give them my sizes and they would customize it exactly right. Rafia hopes to change public attitudes about women's bodies, normalizing the right to dress without conforming to global fashion standards. And that's all for today. Thank you so much for being a part of Network Africa. I'm Layo Adegoki.